the button. Shut the fuck up, Linda. Gil, thank you so much for joining me today. For those of you who do not know who this man is, this man has been on my channel multiple times. Same with David that we had on earlier this week for the WTA recap. We have Gil for the ATP recap. And what a better way than talking to this guy right here. Monday match analysis, tennis channel commentator now, recently an LA native. How are you, bud? I'm great, Phil. Good to be back. Good to hear your voice, see your face. Let's get into it. I think the first, the first thing I have to ask you, and I asked David the same question, we'll kind of go off that format. How would you describe the men's ATP singles main draw this year in one word? One word? One word. Because the podcast. The <laughs> I mean, well, we, we dissect um, the one word. Okay. Okay. We Sounds dissect good. the one word. Satisfying satisfying i like that was that because nope i'm not going to say that joke that was a bad joke in my mind for novak um but how would you in terms of satisfying i think the final summed up the week perfectly and for those who have missed that final i don't think we could have asked for a better ending with rafa getting 21 slams yeah i i think the the final absolutely delivered Mm -hmm. unless you're like the match quality police, which uh, <laughs> some people are out there, but no, it was an amazing match. It was a great mm -hmm. match. Uh, the, the story is, is incredible. And uh, there were, there were plenty of, there were plenty of awesome matches. And the, if you look at the quarterfinal lineup alone, mm -hmm. I don't think there's one quarterfinal that was kind of like, mm, that's going to be a clunker. Right. Yeah. Uh, that that just wasn't out there. Every quarterfinal was interesting. I thought Felix and Medvedev in five sets was amazing. Uh, I really liked the Titipas Medvedev semifinal. Mm -hmm. That that match, the match quality police would even like that match. That was really good <laughs> stuff by both. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess early rounds. I I don't know if you know. I feel like the first week kind of carries itself I, mm -hmm. I never find the first week of a major to be like disappointing there's enough mm -hmm. out there there's enough matches where i uh, th that's gonna kind of take care of its own but the second week sometimes you have better second weeks worse second weeks this was a good one yeah and i and i agree i think for a lot of people i think the quality of matches that we had lined up in the first week alone was overshadowed a little bit by the whole novak situation which it had its moment it and then we move past it and then the quality just spoke for itself i think who, who, in your mind who was the biggest besides medvedev who do you think was the most outstanding player to you at least that kind of came through in this tournament who who stood out to you in terms of the men felix for sure mm -hmm. how come and, and part of that might be Part of that might be just overall 2022 because mm -hmm. at the ATP Cup he he blew me away and mm -hmm. I just think as far as as far as a player coming back after an off season and just showing growth in almost too many areas to count mm -hmm. from his nerve management which I think was kind of the biggest the most important thing for him and we saw that get better last year in his runs at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open so you could kind of feel that coming around. Mm -hmm. ATP cup was a different level, the way he handled the, the pressure of the final and playing for Canada and beating, beating Zverev when Canada needed a win and Zverev mm -hmm. didn't need a win for Germany. Germany was already eliminated. I was really impressed with that. And then from a game perspective, he is more patient, his shot tolerance, his discipline is better. He's using his legs. He's defending his, his court positioning is more dynamic now backing up when he needs to defend still, you know, willing to move forward and his transition game looks better. His return strategies are more varied. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just a way, way better player. And that has been immediately clear at the start here. And uh, he didn't have his best tennis in, in some of the matches early on, you know, mm -hmm. against Emil Rusevori, for example, exactly. he was able to fight through win ugly. And then he found his game and, and started to do really amazing things. And, uh, it's up two sets to love on Medvedev and mm -hmm. had, had a match point in that match. And it wasn't a choke. Like Medvedev, Medvedev came back. Yeah. Medvedev 
came back and won the last three sets, but you know, it wasn't a choke. I, I totally agree. I think Medvedev really showed his game this tournament, not just from the perspective of last year and winning his first major, but the idea that he's going to be around a long time. And for me, besides history being made this tournament, I think Medvedev really showed why he's going to be dominating for the next five years on tour, just from his ability to play that villain role to a degree that people like and playing that role of being the guy that everyone wants to beat now besides like besides the big three because Federer is basically not he's doing his own thing Rafa's somehow won 21 majors now Novak's doing his own thing but Medvedev now for me has been shockingly so impressive and so consistent because after the 2019 season of that summer that he had, no one thought he would be able to repeat kind of that progress and dominance and that success. So for me, seeing him like that was amazing. Yeah. uh, He's, he's definitely continued to get better in, in a lot of areas, but he's still the same guy stylistically. But Mm -hmm. if you just look at like, I think that version of Medvedev, if you gave him a lot of slice, if you came to net a lot on him, like there were certain things stylistically that players started to do from a game plan perspective, just seeing how flat his strokes were, how he liked to redirect pace. There was a point in time where the tour was like, I know Daniil Medvedev, you have to play differently against him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change my game whenever I play him. And that was working for a little bit. And now it's definitely not. Um, and it's, he, he's such a, he's such a problem. And, and you're right. I mean, I thought even after losing this final, I've never been more convinced that he's going to win on top of the, the U S open that he won last year. You know, I think he'll get to four or more hardcore slams in his career. I, I totally agree. And there was a couple other names that I wanted to throw out you throw out at you. English is hard this morning. So another Canadian that we have to point out is Chapeau. Mm-hmm. The way he played this tournament from beating Opelka, then Zverev, pretty, I wouldn't say handily, but a pretty convincing win over Zverev. Another guy that has kind of come out and said that me... Daniil, Sissipas are the next guys, and the, we're the new big three. But Chapo really proved him wrong in that sense and showed that he has the ability and the fact that he came back to push Nadal to five sets is incredible. And kind of going back to that ATP Cup run that Canada had, it, he really continued to show his maturity on court besides his mini meltdown during the Nadal match. Talk to me a little bit more about Chapo and how he kind of showed himself in this tournament. Well, he played two big servers in Opelka and Zverev back to back. Mm-hmm. And his return has been an issue for him. It hasn't been good at all mm-hmm. on, on these quick courts, especially. But he has a new coach, Jamie Delgado, who got him to block his return. And by the way, I, I mean, his last coach, Mikhail Yuzny, got him to block his return for a little bit. And I don't know what happened because it, it went away. Yeah. So, you know, my, my read on that is that every coach tells him to block his return. Yeah. And he just started listening because it was a new coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to impress your new, your new acquisition there. Like, okay, I'm going to listen to everything you say. They're in the honeymoon phase. Oh God. Uh, so, yeah, he, he blocks his return. He gets a lot of returns back against mm-hmm. Opelka and Zverev. And, and that's kind of where it starts for Shapovalov is putting the ball in place so he, he can use his athleticism and he can use his firepower. Now, I, I didn't really watch much of that Opelka match. I thought Zverev put in an, a stinker. Uh, I just think he mm-hmm. was really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also think he should have beat Nadal. You know, mm-hmm. I think Nadal was there to to be had with the, the state of his physical mm-hmm. with, you know, suffering from heat stroke and absolutely Dennis shot himself in the foot a lot in that match. So for being honest, it's a good run. 
Mm -hmm. I was happy to see him make this run. And I think it'll help him because he clearly needed the off season. He needed that mental reset and it's helped him and he's changed coaches and he's in a good spot and it's mostly positive, but from an actual, like how well did he play? I'm not as impressed with Shapovalov. Mm -hmm. I, I just think he, he had a big win. Zverev was was very bad. He totally took advantage and used his talents mm-hmm. against Nadal. That's a match in my book. I'm I'm not going to give him high marks for pushing it to five. Okay. I thought he should have won the match. Absolutely, I like that because I, I I totally agree with you there in terms of how he could have played versus how he did play, and kind of turning back the clock a little bit. Gaël Monfils was a story that we saw this year that was very impressive, and. It's funny how on Twitter we see is Vitalina does really bad. Monfils just excels. If Monfils does really bad, <laughs> Svitolina excels. But besides that storyline, Monfils, for a guy that switched brands completely from going from Wilson to Artango, complete gear change to absolutely going to a point where he pushes Berrettini to five, which was in my opinion, it was a good match. Mm-hmm. I, and being the likes of, and just looking at this right here, Bublik straight sets, that was pretty easy for him. Beating Garin, Ketsmanovic, and then playing a strong Berrettini. I, I mean, Monfils is really looking to push and kind of rejuvenate his career here. And he believes, which is really cool, because, mm-hmm. I mean, he really could have, it, it was looking pretty glum for uh at least until until canada last year Mm -hmm. i mean his his results were were really bad for over a year ever since the pandemic pause he was Mm -hmm. playing great pandemic pause he played awful in the in the no crowd environment after the pandemic there's there's no doubt about it and you know so it it was so good to see him kind of just break out and come back into himself last year Mm -hmm. uh during the summer and this was a continuation of that And uh, he's playing really smart. He's playing the smartest he ever has in his career as his athleticism sort of uh, declines as it does naturally with age. Mm -hmm. Monfils is constructing points better. His shot selection is better. He's he's understanding kind of the balance between defense and attack and Mm -hmm. has has a clear mind. And he's, you know, his tennis skills have always been amazing in terms of his ball striking Mm -hmm. and it hasn't it's never just been like Monfils's athleticism is is all he has no no he he's got a great return Mm -hmm. he he's really good off both wings he does amazing things with his racket Mm -hmm. and it was his point construction and his decision making those are the things that that held him back and now I think he's maximizing what he can do um from a ball striking perspective, because he's positioning himself on the court correctly. He's hitting, he's going for the right shots. And I, I loved how efficient he was at this tournament in, Mm -hmm. in dispatching his opponents that uh, he sometimes got into wars early in majors oftentimes, and he avoided that in this one. So really happy. And it's so good for tennis that Monfils is, is charging ahead. You know, mm-hmm. he's and and he still believes that he can achieve more in his career than than he has to date in the future. Mm-hmm. And it's it's funny uh, how you mentioned last year because of the pandemic and Monfils, if we break down his actual his history on tour, he's one of the guys that has won almost a title every single year that he's been on tour, an ATP level title believe that streak is still going on did he win one last year i don't think he won one um now i think he might have i think he has a final streak now final but streak I, now I, I think that's what it is and that, and he's already he's already made a final this yeah, year as well this year too uh because he he won adelaide mm-hmm. i believe uh so yeah it's very long <laughs> it's very long but it just shows you the longevity and i think when I was talking to David earlier, and for those of you who have not seen it, definitely check it out about the WTA. The idea that if you're happy off court, you're happy on the court. And Monfils seems to have found that click again and that magic that made him special 
years ago and kind of rejuvenated that idea and philosophy behind it too. So seeing him in that position is quite frankly, incredible. And another guy that's kind of found that belief is Taylor Fritz. First time that he, the first time he made the second week of a grand slam and talk to us a little bit about Taylor Fritz, because this is a guy that I'm starting to really enjoy now. I really thought he'd beat CT pass. And um, (laughs) I was, I was hoping for it. Yeah. And uh, he, he nearly did Mm -hmm. now. The, the positives and there are way more positives than negatives Mm -hmm. is, is Fritz and, and his coaches have gotten him to just understand who he is as a player. Mm -hmm. And that's a guy who hits the ball as well as anyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone and his movement and his athleticism, it's never going to be never going to be of the quality of Carlos Alcaraz. It's just, that's not going to ever happen for him. He can't, he doesn't have that in him. Mm -hmm. So Taylor's got to be aggressive. He's got to control points. He's got to use his serve and his forehand and his backhand to be imposing, to be Mm -hmm. offensive. And, and Fritz now has that mentality point in and point out where he, you know, if you drop the ball short, he is not going to cheat himself. He is going to obliterate the tennis ball yeah. every time he can. And that was not early in, in Fritz's career. That was just not how he was playing. Absolutely. And he's way better for it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, just understanding what his skill set is. And, you know, if he's dictating, then his movement becomes a lot less important. Yeah. Um, now, what we also saw in the Tsitsipas match was just a, a drop in level kind of at the end of sets when he needed mm-hmm. it. And it was just a, a match that he really had the tennis to win. And it was definitely the head getting in the way and just the, the nerve management yeah. because pressure was, situations. Exactly. I mean, he, he never, he never lost serve early in a set early no. in a set. He was fine. Only lost serve when the scoreboard pressure kind of mounted and then he was a, a different player. So yeah. that was a, that's something he needs to work through. If the mental clicks and, and he's able to believe in himself in the big spots and the pressure moments, mm-hmm. I think, I think he's going to be in the top 10 and wow. it's a, it's a crowded top 10 right now. Mm-hmm. So that that's hard because the, the top 10 is all, they're all young. Then there's Nadal and Djokovic. <laughs> so it, it's a crazy time to it, try to make the top 10. It, it's funny because it's, we're saying that now, and we've been saying it for years of cracking that top 10 without the big three. And it's kind of feeling like that now without, Roger in it too and I kind of have to take that out of the narrative because we're kind of past the point where we can continue to say these guys or at least Roger and I hate to say that as a Roger fan but it's true yeah so having someone like Taylor Fritz getting up there and being the next guy and I think Riley Opelka's quote I don't know if it was from a warm-up tournament or no it was during the Australian Open when he said even the best Americans not participating at the Australian Open with Jensen Brooksby it's it's amazing to see that amount of guys that have that talent. Brandon Nakashima, Jensen Brooksby, Riley, Fritz, Tommy Paul has been playing the best tennis, and we'll probably see a lot more of that this year, uh, despite losing that second-round match to Kitsmanovic. We're going to be seeing them a lot more than we think. Talk, yeah. talk to me a little bit more about that American tennis that we have at least coming up, because for the women, we saw that in the women's draw completely this year. What about the men? It's funny. I still take for granted a woman making a major final, an American <laughs> woman, right? It's just yeah. kind of a normal thing. Like, oh, Collins, sure. Uh, <laughs> Why imagine, not? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, it, but the, uh, if a man, I mean, a man hasn't done it in, in so long, it Since feels like it feels like it would just be a bigger deal. 2000 something with Roddick at Wimbledon. Right. So, you know, it's, it's funny that way, you know, it's like... Mm-hmm. Last year, Kennan. Okay, yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> Dropping outside the top 100 after this tournament, but that's okay. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I guess at a certain point, you have enough enough guys in the mix where uh, just you're based on math, you're going to have players deep in slams, and, and that's going to happen very quickly for American tennis. It was always it was very interesting at the U.S. Open to see 
you know, who is going to last the longest and Tiafo made a great run and Brooksby made a great run. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of guys with top 20 potential. Yeah, there are, it doesn't appear there's anyone. And honestly, you know, I would, I would put both Brooksba, Brooksby, Corda, Brooksba. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that guy, I, I, that, that, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Brooksba. Brooksba. Uh I would Brooks put, kept that's, up right that's there. the doubles team. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the doubles team, Brooksba. Um Brooksba. Davis Cup 2025. Uh <laughs> I, I don't think there's any top five guy in there. I and I would I would love I would love one of them to prove me wrong. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there's potentially top 10 players, but not top five players. Uh and the question is, is there is there a major champion there? Right. But is that the bar, yeah. you know, because I think w- we saw kind of how spoiled the coverage of Andy Roddick was in the previous generation where it's like, oh, you know, Roddick can't win a slam like he stinks. And now it's like, no, <laughs> right. And now it's now it's but that was the coverage, right? Yeah. Like, will he ever get yeah. over the hump of beating Federer at Wimbledon? That was that exactly. was kind of his legacy that people remember him for because after the U S open when he won his first major and then Wimbledon was his best shot the way he played to get that second slam, at least in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he kept, what was it? Four times that he lost to Federer in the final of Wimbledon. I don't think four or three. I think it might've been three, three, uh, 2009. Um, 2009. No, no, not 2000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was 2009, 2007, and maybe 2005. 07 was Federer and Nadal. Oh, that's right. The final. When was... Then it must have been He probably lost to Federer earlier, but... Yeah, but the Uh, point being, he... His legacy was known for being overshadowed by Roger. Yeah. And, And that's, you know, that's the burden he carried because of the generation before him. Exactly. You know, it wasn't it wasn't Roddick's fault. It was it was Jim Courier's fault that Roddick was getting so much crap. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, that's that's how it that's what it was. So now we've experienced this post Roddick generation mm-hmm. where it's like, God, I it would be nice to have a top 10 player again. Yeah, that's not so, Isner. no offense. Right. Right. So so the bar the bar is now lowered which is a good thing. I know that sounds bad. Like Mm -hmm. you want to raise the bar, but no, the bar was a little bit, a little bit unrealistic. And, and I think it was a burden on American players Mm -hmm. that the bar was like, you have to win slams or, or you're not like serving American tennis. Well, did you see the documentary, the Marty fish documentary? Oh, I absolutely loved it. The, the amount of pressure that that he felt it's it, it, it puts it into light too. And I highly recommend, I think I did a video on, Marty Fish, I think I did a video on his documentary, but the the pressure that he had alongside Andy Roddick is quite incredible. And to think that Marty Fish even made the ATP finals is something that, again, we haven't seen from an American since Roddick. So being able to have someone with that kind of momentum, and that doesn't include the Bryan brothers with doubles too, like having that singles victory itself was from a mental standpoint insane it's quite incredible what went through his mind just to kind of be back into just getting back into the top 20 yeah and right i mean and and it it wasn't appreciated at the time as much Mm -hmm. as it should have 100 percent, 100 percent. especially with the way he played who he was playing around to it's it's hard because it's kind of, and I use this analogy for tennis uh, with soccer. It's imagine being overshadowed when you have Messi and Ronaldo still playing, when you have a Neymar playing, when you have a Lewandowski playing, when you have all these other guys, Kareem Benzema, when you have all these other world-class players that are actually might be performing better than Ronaldo and Messi, they're not getting the same attention that these two players, because they're the, they're the greatest of all time that we've seen playing. And we Mm -hmm. see that with Roger and Rafa and Novak, it's just overshadowing with the amount of smaller 
smaller talent that they have. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I boring you? No, no. Oh. My eye is itchy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were falling asleep on me. <laughs> no, but that's, that's, that's how I kind of compared the two. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, you know, the big three era, as you, as you uh, pointed out, is, has been the big two era in, in the last couple of years. But, but we're in a fascinating time because y- you have legitimate contenders mm-hmm. um, like, like Medvedev. And I think Alcaraz coming up is, is uh, mm-hmm. you know, you just give it a little bit of time and he's going to be right up there, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And CT pass on clay now is going to be a major and legitimate hurdle. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if there was a, if there was an adult CT pass match on clay tomorrow, Ooh. this would, uh, this would not be a straightforward match. Yeah. Uh, this would, this would be a, a really good match. So it's an exciting time. It's going to be fun, fun to watch how open the French open actually might be this year. If, if Rafa plays. It, it's going to be a lot more trying to see, okay, who's going to be the overall favorite because I feel like that's, it's not straightforward anymore. It, it hasn't been, but it, right now, even though Rafa just won Australia, even last year, you feel like that it, it's still not a straightforward answer besides Rafa. Yeah. He stopped sweeping the, the clay court season mm-hmm. a couple, you know, for, for now a couple, a couple of years, it's been, it hasn't been that way. Like it used to where Rafa comes and wins Monte Carlo. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to Barcelona, wins Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And then he gets like his, his one loss in Madrid. And then he goes and wins Rome. Yeah. And then he goes to the French and then he wins that. Like yeah. we haven't seen that in, in a couple years now, mm-hmm. like it. And, and that's how it used to be. So, yeah. The the change started there, mm-hmm. and obviously, obviously, we'll see with Novak what what happens, and and if mm-hmm. he's in the mix, and there's there's going to be vaccination guideline questions that are going to affect things for probably the rest of the year for him. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if Nadal and Djokovic played at in the in a Roland Garros final, that would be you know probably the biggest tennis match that that we've seen in our lifetime. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And one of the last topics that I wanted to bring up to you was who was, and I hate using the word bus, but I feel like it's the category of who do you think had, I guess, the most disappointing tournament from a talent standpoint? Because I feel like they're, who we expected to go far is kind of straightforward. And I think who we picked there were some maybe upsets that we didn't see coming but besides that who do you think had the most disappointing opening grand slam tournament the first person who comes to mind is is her who lost to manorino mm. now he did look better that loss aged well because manorino beat karatsev mm-hmm. and manorino is is a matchup that is very tough yeah, very tricky, very niche. So, like, it, you know, he might be a good matchup for some players, but might be a horrible matchup for some players, depending on, on kind of what you like and and what you look for. Um, Sorry, it, but, it sounded like something just exploded in my backyard. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess another thing is um, with Hercotch is just last year wasn't consistent, despite it being really an amazing year. Mm-hmm. For Hercotch, it was a couple of runs. Yeah, it wasn't um, it wasn't consistent results. So, uh, I think I think that's one. Um, I'm trying to think. How about Cam Nori? Uh, yeah, I mean, so Nori was. That was definitely that was definitely a disappointing loss for uh, for Nori to. Um, mm-hmm. I remember it was straight sets, but but who did he lose to Fritz? I think so. Yeah, um, he was his confidence was destroyed from ATP Cup. Uh, ATP Cup is great because you get to play, you know, top competition. But Great Britain was in the best group, yeah. and Nori's number one singles, and he loses to Felix. And no, Zverev he lost a quarter. In France, oh right, quarter. He lost a quarter in straight sets. It was six three, six zero, six four. But Corda yeah. then won another round. He won against Mutet and then lost to Karina Busta 
in four, which is right. not a bad loss because Cord is Corda. Yeah, but but the way he lost was bad. I mean, I mm-hmm. think he was clearly affected by starting the year 0-3. Mm-hmm. And also, Nori hasn't done well in, in majors, which is, it's weird. He's a cardio machine. Mm-hmm. He should love the best of five. But if you look at his losses, first of all, he's had bad draws. Mm-hmm. He's he's lost to, you know, Federer at Wimbledon, Nadal in Paris. Uh, it's been it's been brutal for him. Mm-hmm. But he he keeps losing in straight sets. So he, he doesn't have a chance to use his cardio, but he's been much better outside of uh, outside of slams and starting the year. zero and three go to a major where I think he ha- he's putting a lot of pressure on himself to play better in these in these events. Mm-hmm. That was difficult for for Cam Nori. Yeah. Then you also look at at Rublev with another disappointing loss against Marin Chilich. Chilich played ridiculously well. Like, it's, I don't I don't shocking. know what to. Yeah, I, I mean, in that match, I don't know how much you can really take away from Rublev, but I will say the frustration needs to be piling up because he has lost four majors in a row to players outside the top 20. It, it It's it's surprising, though, that Chilich, and it's, I'm not going to give take credit away from Chilich. He is a Grand Slam champion. I will say that. He is one of the better players, kind of a forgotten player, champion in this generation as well at least in my opinion but Chilich won he didn't face the best of talent but then he played Rublev and absolutely floored him at least the way he played Mm -hmm. and we haven't I don't think we've seen him play like that in a very long time and for it was funny because I was listening I think to the tennis podcast and someone asked them if Chilich was an actual contender after beating Rublev. And to be honest, I was like, would I really consider him a one to possibly win? And I went, not really, but if he plays like that, maybe it's just so hard to put Chilich into that category of talent in even when he took the first set against Felix, Felix didn't have a straightforward match against him because that went four and two of the sets went seven, six. So for me, Chilich was, I think one of the bigger shocks, the way, just the way he played, not just because we yeah. lost. He was one of the bigger shocks. I, I agree how, you know, but he, he fell off. Uh, he, he couldn't keep, he couldn't maintain that level. If mm-hmm. you watch, you know, the Felix match, like the, I agree. the way he was hitting his forehand against Rublev was the best I've ever seen. It was, it was a literal bazooka Del Potro like mm-hmm. performance Hammer. on the forehand side. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the big change. You know, he always hits his first serve big. He's hitting a second serve better. He was having issues with that. Mm-hmm. But it was just like every time he got a forehand, he was just doing punishing damage on it. And uh, then he just started missing it again. You know, I mean, so so I don't know how sustainable it was, but I think his coaches are getting him to play bigger, to be very, you know, unapologetically aggressive on on every single mm-hmm. ball. And I think that's the best way for him to play. And I think on the grass, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be dangerous. And I do think that we'll see some, some Chilich runs, which I wasn't convinced of it at one point. Mm-hmm. I thought that it was kind of steep decline in his career. And that was it. But I think uh-huh. at, at this point, he's shown enough that there's going to be moments where, uh, where Chilich is going to be really good. And I don't think anyone wants to see him in their draw outside of a, you know, a really slow play in court. I, I totally agree. And it, it kind of reminded me of Berrettini and how he played a little bit just because of how dominant that serve and forehand combo he has. And to kind of wrap it all up, the last person to talk about is Berrettini because he he had a huge apparel switch to Hugo Boss. He kind of has taken that role of being one of the next guys up, making another Grand Slam semifinal. And the way he's kind of presented himself is he's good enough to get to the semifinals, but as soon as he plays someone of that caliber of a top five player, his backhand screwed. And I think that's getting ever more apparent towards him now after he played, who did he play? Uh, Rafa 
Like it was just so, so easy. I think in terms of Rafa beating him, the strategy yeah. is so simple. Yeah, it, 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 it is. And part of it is execution, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you need to, for example, if you don't return, well, he doesn't need to hit any backhands. He holds serve every time without hitting a backhand. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just one example. But when he, when he faces elite players with a return. So I think against team, he has wins against team, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Team struggles on return. He uh, he can beat Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas struggles on return against Medvedev and Zverev and Nadal and Djokovic. I agree. He it looks it seems like there's nothing he can do. It mm -hmm. seems like he can't win those matches at the moment, and uh, it's down to the backhand and the movement. You drag Mateo into a rally. You attack the backhand. You attack the movement, and he he doesn't win. He doesn't win rallies. So he doesn't win second serve points yeah. because that's that's how tennis is played. Whenever you miss, whenever either player misses the first serve, you're going to play a rally. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do think he can definitely do is return second serves more aggressively. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big point of development. I don't know. I don't know what he can do with his backhand and his movement if those things are going to get better. It's possible that they mm -hmm. won't. Uh, or, or they will incrementally, but not enough, uh, you know, to a point where they'll not probably always be weaknesses. Yeah. It so, can't. so Go ahead. what can Berrettini do? What can Berrettini do to make those next, those next jumps? If his movement and his backhand are always going to be weaknesses, he needs to search for those little things. Mm -hmm. One of those things is, you know, how do I actually play offensive tennis on second serve return points? Because that is just killing him right now. That he doesn't miss returns, but he's just, it's just weak. It's neutral. Right. And like, he's just not going to win in neutral against Nadal. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, and I, I think just by that smile, you know, and I think any tennis player knows at that point, when you play someone with that kind of backhand, you just have to strategize a little bit more than your opponent to beat that backhand. And mm -hmm. And I, I thought he was doing a pretty good job with his slice when he was playing, at least the matches that I saw him play. His slice was getting a lot better, at least being more aggressive with it, with coming to net when he had the opportunity to do so. Just, I think, with that movement as well, I mean, we all we all can make fun of, I think, is how he looks like an upside-down Dorito and how it's just like, whole upper body and then it just gets skinnier on the way down to his torso um but it's his movement i think he can really capitalize this year if he was to work on one thing first it's figuring out how do i last longer at least from a physical standpoint and he has the power for it and i think wimbledon is going to be a big thing for him to kind of repeat that success and find out how he can develop it more towards a surface that would help him with that serve plus forehand. Yeah. The key at Wimbledon is that the slice protects his backhand mm -hmm. you know, when, on that low bouncing surface. If he's going to slice his backhand, uh, he can, he can have success with that. And, and when he plays a righty, who's not Nadal, who's a lefty, just to spell it out, uh, <laughs> he can go cross court safe cross court with the backhand mm -hmm. and, and not get hurt. So it's a, it's a pretty horrific matchup for Berrettini uh, against Nadal. So uh, hopefully, you know, and it's, it's been a horrific matchup against Djokovic too. So maybe he'll get his chance where he doesn't need to play uh, either of those guys. And he's kind of one of the players who can definitely capitalize if we have like a U.S. Open 2014 situation where some mm -hmm. crazy stuff happens, yeah. And and Marin Cilic was the guy to do it there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Berrettini's not losing to anyone ranked lower than him. It's, yeah, which it's amazing. Is, which is a good thing because when you have those top guys, you really expect that consistency, at least in the early rounds, to make the second week of a slam easier than all everyone else just to save your energy. Because we saw that, and I think it came out with Barty too. Like Barty was on court less than. I think it was less than seven hours on court before the final and yep. just having that reserve in your tank. And we always said that about Roger, whenever he played a slam, getting straight set victories are key for him to at least play well in the final. And I think Berrettini as well as Sissipas and Zverev need to do that as well and prove everyone that 
we're here for a reason. We dominate the rest of the group. It's just the elites now that we have to compare ourselves to. Right. And from go ahead, please. No, no, you you go. I I didn't I didn't have anything to add there. Oh, per- <laughs> <laughs> great awkward silence. Uh, <laughs> but um, Gil, I really do appreciate you coming on. Wait, I do have one. I do have one more topic. Oh I, yes, I need please. To, we need to. We have to talk about this. Yes. What please. did you think of? Uh, so you talk about Medvedev being a, a villain, mm-hmm. and um, kind of embracing that role and and it looked like he did it looks like he does embrace that role and and he doesn't care what the crowd thinks Mm -hmm. and he's kind of being that that outlaw figure Mm -hmm. then you know it becomes clear after the final that it's affecting him like he he's hurt by it it's not like Mm -hmm. he's not like you know f the crowd like Mm -hmm. you know i'm out there who i'm being a heel i'm being a villain uh but but he it, it affects him I mean, I don't know, I, I guess, how are you, uh, what did you think of the crowd and how Medvedev handled it? Because I think there's a lot of different layers to, to that kind of story. And it's it's really interesting if you look at what he said after the match, if you didn't, uh, if anyone didn't see it, basically he said, like, the kid in me stopped dreaming. Um because he was so kind of, he was so, I guess, hurt by the crowd cheering for all of his mistakes that he's like, I'm just going to play for myself now. I don't play for anyone else. I'll just play for me, my family, Russia, and that's it. I, I think it is complicated, like you said, when it comes to playing not just for yourself, but for everyone else, because it becomes an entertainment factor as well and how other people receive you as a player in New York. I think he did a really good job of understanding that crowd. And Mm -hmm. I think New York is a very tough place to gain people's trust or to gain people's favor. Australia was a different level. I think that was the time where, and we even saw it with the umpires trying to get people to just be quiet in between serves even on that ball toss too, it was just, there's a, there's a fine line between like having fun with players and disrespecting what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And Medvedev really, for the first time, I think in his career through this entirety of his success really understood what it felt like to kind of be the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Not villain. It's just the guy that people just root against. It's not even a villain. It's just, they want to see him fail. And Mm -hmm. I think he wanted to prove everyone wrong. I think if he won Australia, it would have been a totally different story. I think everything would have been different when he started in his speech and just thanking his wife and his team and not thanking the crowd that I think that's where we saw. Okay. It's it finally got to him that what he's doing on court is going to affect how everyone's going to react to him because there was no forgiveness at all. There was not at one point where I think the crowd wanted him to win as much as he thought he did. So and it's funny because I saw it's like when you go to Twitter, you expect like giant memes of everything happening. But there was one where the Australia crowd, like the crowd pushed him away. And the guy that embraced him was Novak Djokovic. And I think he finally got a taste of what, and it's a totally different situation with Novak, but he understood what being unpopular meant while having success. Yep. And one of the other, I think, important things to note is that it seems like, you know, he feels like part of why he, he, gets cheered against is because he's Russian and he made that very mm. clear. And and that must be really hard. Like, yeah. and I don't, you know, it's, it's hard to prove if that's true or not. Um, it really definitively, is. Definitively. And it right? becomes, it's, and it becomes a whole different topic of like politics and belief systems that we, we personally do not understand. Right. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but, But think about it, like if you feel that way, but what what we can do is imagine feeling that way. Imagine Mm -hmm. 
imagine playing in Australia and and believing that they they are rooting against me because I'm Russian. Uh, I mean, that's got to be really, really hard. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the other side of the coin, I think there's balance here. And Medvedev isn't just, he's not a hundred percent victim. He, uh, he does some things that are going to turn the crowd against him. Mm -hmm. He has sometimes, you know, reacted to the crowd kind of mockingly, yeah. um, at, at times when they're rooting against him, he's almost egged them on. Mm -hmm. And then I think more importantly, and this is something I'd like him to, to cut out is, uh, he's been very disrespectful to umpires at times. And yeah. I, and I'm not saying he's arguing with calls, like, because that's fine. Yeah. Everybody does that. It's not a big deal, but you know, don't call an umpire stupid. Don't call an umpire, a small cat. Like it, yeah. it's like, there's a certain level of respect that, that you can maintain. Also maybe like, don't raise your voice as much as you did in yeah. that TT pass situation. Uh, maybe, maybe just try to control yourself and speak to the umpire like a fellow human being. So I think in that case, there's room to critique Medvedev and not, and say like, look, like these things that you do, they are going to, they are not going to be popular with the crowd. Yeah. And, and, and I can, and thank you for bringing that up because I completely forgot about the giant outburst because there's no other way to describe how he reacted to the umpire and there is always that mutual uh kind of quote-unquote banter between an umpire and a player and we we've always seen that i i believe like through like just small conversations with the umpire whether it was fonini murray curios we've seen that too but the way we saw medvedev kind of uh, I, I thought his whole face was going to explode. Like it was, it was John McEnroe S to the point of it's scary watching that reaction. Like I felt uncomfortable. Like when a crowd starts yeah. to feel uncomfortable, when you get to that point of screaming at a human being for not doing their job, it becomes a whole different level of how people see you. And, and look, we all know about the sister pass situation. We all know, what his dad does and how it was kind of, and I don't know if you saw this, but there was like another umpire in the tunnel that was watching out for sister passes, coaching calls, kind of like a, mm -hmm. like a spy gate or something. Like everyone's kind of trying to figure that out, but yeah. he's, they, they're all fully aware of the situation. All you can do is just ask him about it because the fact that did he get a warning at all for that kind of outburst? No, uh, amazingly, amazingly, he did not. There was no warning that and, and it, it was. It, it was just scary because as much as we and I, I've been growing on Medvedev and he's been probably one of my favorite players to kind of watch on tour because of that personality that he has on court and kind of how he has that silence of concentration, even when he gets mad, it's you know, something's coming, you know, like he's going to do something awesome. But yep. when you start screaming, like you're about to lose your voice, that's, that's a whole nother level of kind of craziness. And it's kind of like that level of Novak when he started screaming at the box or screaming at the umpire, how much more do you want to play during the French when it was raining? Like it's like <laughs> that it's that it's that kind of scream that you just go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go like you, yeah. you like, awkwardly walk out because you just don't want to be a part of it anymore and that's how i felt towards that situation yeah well said i i just i think there's so much to like about daniel medvedev i'm with mm -hmm. you uh, on on him being one of my favorite players to watch at this point but you know just treat umpires better like i yeah. i think that i i hope that i hope he makes that change I hope he makes an effort. You know, what he does do is he take, takes responsibility and says, sorry, but yeah. you know, it's not, it's kind of too late after been doing that it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've seen it, we've seen it for a couple of years. So mm -hmm. it's like at a certain point, it's like, it's great that you take responsibility for it, but let's, let's cut it out. At, at, at this point too. I mean, 
we all and we're probably and I'm very excited for this Netflix documentary that they're going to do about tennis because I think we're going to hear a lot about this situation with him and his coach um, coming up. And while even the ATP and tennis TV was hyping up that kind of quote unquote rivalry between Medvedev and Sissipas, they posted the whole. I think highlight of Medvedev and Sissipas when that first altercation happened in Miami, they posted that whole thing and we expected it to kind of have fireworks, but the handshake afterwards as well was half-assed the, it like, we all knew what was coming, but to have Medvedev react to not Sissipas, but towards the umpire that way is a whole different level of, holy shit what are you doing stop you know what i mean it's yeah it, it's it's beyond belief what how he reacted that way yep so yeah so i mean I, in the final you, you know you, you know the crowd's going to be pro rafa but yeah you also wonder would they have respected medvedev more if he didn't do had, it yeah it had he just been a little bit you know, if had he been on better behavior throughout the tournament and in the curious match, I, I keep, I keep uh, forgetting exactly what happened. Cause it f- just feels like three years ago, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I know there were issues in that match as well, mm-hmm. be- yeah. you know, with, with him and the crowd just clashing. And then you think, Oh, it's cause it's cause it's an Australian, but and no, I mean yeah. the crowd, Australia just didn't like him this week. I don't think they did in these last two weeks. They, he just was not, not the favorite at all, which I, which is shocking because you would think that they would love that kind of swagger personality. I hate you. I don't you know, man. Me. I think you don't think mm-hmm. they would have liked that because I feel like it would have been and the way I saw that trophy ceremony going is the same way what happened with Serena and Osaka. As soon as they step up to the plate or when Osaka stepped up, they started booing. It's the same way I would have seen if Medvedev won. Just that kind of reaction. He got he got booed when he for the first time, and I I wasn't sure if he was getting sued, but he was getting booed when when he got introduced. I know, which I've never seen. It's like as soon as that happened, I'm like, whoa. It, um, it, they didn't even do that for McEnroe. They didn't even do that for I think I can't even think of a player that they would boo straight off the bat. Yeah. My, my understanding of Australian culture, though, which is not great, I've never been there, but what I've been told, yeah. and my, my longtime childhood coach was, was an Aussie, they don't like anyone to act more important than anyone else. Like, it's mm. not a, I don't think it's a culture that embraces that sort of, uh, I guess, uh, like, don't be a dick. Big timing. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, it's not like New York. New York is like, New York sees someone be a dick and they're like, Hey, one of us. I don't think it's, I don't think it's like that. In Australia. No, I, I don't think so either. And I, I agree. I think that's a very good point to kind of wrap it up on. You just have to show mutual respect. You just have mm-hmm. to do it at least in that environment where, you know, like the Aussies love Rafa too. They've always loved him. They always loved his mentality and they always showed him love. And Medvedev, I guess, just didn't reciprocate that to the fans. And I think that's a great moment to kind of wrap this entire video on. And Gil, I really do appreciate you coming on, man, and talking to us about this. This is a lot of fun every time you come on. So make sure to go check him out on Twitter. He's a lot of fun to listen to as well on Tennis Channel. He does have a, what's your next emoji that you're putting next to your name so people can recognize you? <laughs> it was the, it's, it's the boomerang. It's the boomerang for the Aussie. What's the next one? Just another tennis ball or is it going to be? No, no, that's a great gonna, point. I that's a decision that I need to make. And, and, you Please know, make it a baguette when it's the, the Aussie's French. over. You got to make it a baguette when it's the okay. French. I'll keep that in mind just thank for you. you. Thank you. I just want to point that out. Yeah. Um, thank you. Fun as for- always. Thank- thanks for having me on. No worries, man. I appreciate it. And make sure to go check them out and hope to see you guys soon. Thank you guys. <laughs>